Chapter Ten, Part Four of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amanda Hindman. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt, Chapter Ten, The Presidency, Making an Old Party Progressive, Part Four. Exactly what was done in the particular crisis to which I refer is shown in the following letter which, after our policy had been successfully put into execution, I sent to the then Speaker of the California Lower House of the Legislature. The White House, Washington, February eighth, 1909. Honorable P. A. Stanton, Speaker of the Assembly, Sacramento, California. I trust there will be no misunderstanding of the federal government's attitude. We are jealously endeavoring to guard the interests of California and of the entire West in accordance with the desires of our Western people. By friendly agreement with Japan, we are now carrying out a policy which, while meeting the interests and desires of the Pacific Slope, is yet compatible not merely with mutual self-respect but with mutual esteem and admiration between the Americans and Japanese. The Japanese government is loyally and in good faith doing its part to carry out this policy, precisely as the American government is doing. The policy aims at mutuality of obligation and behavior. In accordance with it, the purpose is that the Japanese shall come here exactly as Americans go to Japan, which is in effect that travelers, students, persons engaged in international business, men who sojourn for pleasure or study, and the like, shall have the freest access from one country to the other, and shall be sure of the best treatment, but that there shall be no settlement in mass by the people of either country in the other. During the last six months, under this policy, more Japanese have left the country than have come in, and the total number in the United States has diminished by over 2,000. These figures are absolutely accurate and cannot be impeached. In other words, if the present policy is consistently followed and works as well in the future as it is now working, all difficulties and causes of friction will disappear, while at the same time each nation will retain its self-respect and the good will of the other. But such a bill as this school bill accomplishes literally nothing whatever in the line of the object aimed at, and gives just and grave cause for irritation while in addition the united states government would be obliged immediately to take action in the federal courts to test such legislation as we hold it to be clearly a violation of the treaty on this point i refer you to the numerous decisions of the united states supreme court in regard to state laws which violate treaty obligations of the united states the legislation would accomplish nothing beneficial and would certainly cause some mischief and might cause very grave mischief in short, the policy of the administration is to combine the maximum of efficiency in achieving the real object which the people of the Pacific Slope have at heart, with the minimum of friction and trouble, while the misguided men who advocate such action as this against which I protest are following a policy which combines the very minimum of efficiency with the maximum of insult, and which, while totally failing to achieve any real result for good, yet might accomplish an infinity of harm. If in the next year or two the action of the federal government fails to achieve what it is now achieving, then through the further action of the President and Congress it can be made entirely efficient. I am sure that the sound judgment of the people of California will support you, Mr. Speaker, in your effort. Let me repeat that at present we are actually doing the very thing which the people of California wish to be done, and to upset the arrangement under which this is being done cannot do good and may do great harm. If in the next year or two the figures of immigration prove that the arrangement which has worked so successfully during the last six months is no longer working successfully, then there would be ground for grievance and for the reversal by the national government of its present policy. But at present the policy is working well, and until it works badly it would be a grave misfortune to change it, and when changed it can only be changed effectively by the national government. Theodore Roosevelt in foreign and domestic affairs alike, the policy pursued during my administration was simple. In foreign affairs, the principle from which we never deviated was to have the nation behave toward other nations precisely as a strong, honorable, and upright man behaves in dealing with his fellow men. There is no such thing as international law in the sense that there is municipal law or law within a nation. 
Within the nation there is always a judge and a policeman who stands back of the judge. The whole system of law depends first upon the fact that there is a judge competent to pass judgment, and second upon the fact that there is some competent officer whose duty it is to carry out this judgment by force if necessary. In international law there is no judge unless the parties in interest agree that one shall be constituted, and there is no policeman to carry out the judge's orders. In consequence, as yet each nation must depend upon itself for its own protection. The frightful calamities that have befallen China solely because she has no power of self-defense ought to make it inexcusable in any wise American citizen to pretend to patriotic purpose, and yet to fail to insist that the United States shall keep in a condition of ability, if necessary, to assert its rights with a strong hand. It is folly of the criminal type for the nation not to keep up its navy, not to fortify its vital strategic points, and not to provide an adequate army for its needs. On the other hand, it is wicked for the nation to fail in either justice, courtesy, or consideration when dealing with any other power, big or little. John Hay was Secretary of State when I became President, and continued to serve under me until his death. And his and my views, as to the attitude that the nation should take in foreign affairs, were identical, both as regards our duty to be able to protect ourselves against the strong, and as regards our duty always to act not only justly but generously toward the weak. John Hay was one of the most delightful of companions, one of the most charming of all men of cultivation and action. Our views on foreign affairs coincided absolutely, but, as was natural enough, in domestic matters he felt much more conservative than he did in the days when, as a young man, he was private secretary to the great radical democratic leader of the, of the sixties, Abraham Lincoln. He was fond of jesting with me about my supposedly dangerous tendencies in favor of labor against capital. When I was inaugurated on March 4, 1905, I wore a ring he sent me the evening before, containing the hair of Abraham Lincoln. This ring was on my finger when the Chief Justice administered to me the oath of allegiance to the United States. I often thereafter told John Hay that when I wore such a ring on such an occasion, I bound myself more than ever to treat the Constitution, after the manner of Abraham Lincoln, as a document which put human rights above property rights when the two conflicted. The last Christmas John Hay was alive, he sent me the manuscript of a Norse saga by William Morris with the following note. Christmas Eve, 1904. Dear Theodore, In your quality of Viking, this Norse saga should belong to you, and in your character of enemy of property, this Ms. of William Morris will appeal to you. Wishing you a Merry Christmas and many happy years. I am yours affectionately, John Hay. In internal affairs I cannot say that I entered the presidency with any deliberately planned and far-reaching scheme of social betterment. I had, however, certain strong convictions, and I was on the lookout for every opportunity of realizing those convictions. I was bent upon making the government the most efficient possible instrument in helping the people of the United States to better themselves in every way, politically, socially, and industrially. I believed with all my heart in real and thoroughgoing democracy, and I wished to make this democracy industrial as well as political, although I had only partially formulated the methods I believed we should follow. I believed in the people's rights, and therefore in national rights and states' rights, just exactly to the degree in which they severely secured popular rights. I believed in invoking the national power with absolute freedom for every national need, and I believed that the Constitution should be treated as the greatest document ever devised by the wit of man to aid a people in exercising every power necessary for its own betterment, and not as a straitjacket cunningly fashioned to strangle growth. As for the particular methods of realizing these various beliefs, I was content to wait and see what method might be necessary in each given case as it arose, and I was certain that the cases would arise fast enough. As the time for the presidential nomination of 1904 drew near, it became evident that I was strong with the rank and file of the party, but that there was much opposition to me among many of the big political leaders, and especially among many of the Wall Street men. A group of these men met in conference to organize this opposition. It was to be done with complete secrecy, but such secrets are very hard to keep. I speedily knew all about it, and took my measures accordingly. 
the big men in question who possessed much power so long as they could work under cover or so long as they were merely throwing their weight one way or the other between forces fairly evenly balanced were quite helpless when fighting in the open by themselves i never found out that anything practical was even attempted by most of the men who took part in the conference three or four of them however did attempt something the head of one big business corporation attempted to start an effort to control the delegations from new jersey north carolina and certain gulf states against me the head of a great railway system made preparations for a more ambitious effort looking towards the control of the delegations from iowa kansas nebraska colorado and california against me he was a very powerful man financially but his power politically was much more limited and he did not really understand his own limitations or the situation itself whereas i did he could not have secured a delegate against me from iowa nebraska or kansas in colorado and california he could have made a fight but even there i think he would have been completely beaten however long before the time for the convention came around it was recognized that it was hopeless to make any opposition to my nomination the effort was abandoned and i was nominated unanimously judge parker was nominated by the democrats against me practically all the metropolitan newspapers of largest circulation were against me in new york city fifteen out of every sixteen copies of papers issued were hostile to me i won by a popular majority of about two million and a half and in the electoral college carried three hundred and thirty votes against one hundred and thirty six it was by far the largest popular majority ever hitherto given any presidential candidate my opponents during the campaign had laid much stress upon my supposed personal ambition and intention to use the office of president to perpetuate myself in power i did not say anything on the subject prior to the election as i did not wish to say anything that could be construed into a promise offered as a consideration in order to secure votes but on election night after the returns were in i issued the following statement the wise custom which limits the president to two terms regards the substance and not the form and under no circumstances will i be a candidate for or accept another nomination the reason for my choice of the exact phraseology used was twofold in the first place many of my supporters were insisting that as i had served only three and a half years of my first term coming in from the vice presidency when president mckinley was killed i had really had only one elective term so that the third term custom did not apply to me and i wished to repudiate this suggestion i believed then and i believe now the third term custom or tradition to be wholesome and therefore i was determined to regard its substance refusing to quibble over the words usually employed to express it on the other hand i did not wish simply and specifically to say that i would not be a candidate for the nomination of nineteen o eight because if i had specified the year when i would not be a candidate it would have been widely accepted as meaning that i intended to be a candidate some other year and i had no such intention and had no idea that i would ever be a candidate again certain newspaper men did ask me if i intended to apply my prohibition to nineteen twelve and i answered that i was not thinking of nineteen twelve nor of nineteen twenty nor of nineteen forty and that i must decline to say anything whatever except what appeared in my statement the presidency is a great office and the power of the president can be effectively used to secure a renomination especially if the president has the support of certain great political and financial interests it is for this reason and this reason alone that the wholesome principle of continuing in office so long as he is willing to serve an incumbent who has proved capable is not applicable to the presidency therefore the american people have wisely established a custom against allowing any man to hold that office for more than two consecutive terms but every shred of power which a president exercises while in office vanishes absolutely when he has once left office an ex-president stands precisely in the position of any other private citizen and has not one particle more power to secure a nomination or election than if he had never held the office at all indeed he probably has less because of the very fact that he has held the office therefore the reasoning on which the anti-third term custom is based has no application whatever to an ex-president and no application whatever to anything except consecutive terms as a barrier of precaution against more than two consecutive terms the custom embodies a valuable principle applied in any other way it becomes a mere formula and like all formulas a potential source of mischievous confusion having this in mind i regarded the custom as applying practically if not just as much to a president who had been seven and a half years in office as to one who had been eight years in office and therefore in the teeth 
of a practically unanimous demand from my own party that I accept another nomination, and the reasonable certainty that the nomination would be ratified at the polls, I felt that the substance of the custom applied to me in 1908. On the other hand, it had no application whatever to any human being save where it was invoked in the case of a man desiring a third consecutive term. Having given such substantial proof of my own regard for the custom, I deemed it a duty to add this comment on it. I believe that it is well to have a custom of this kind to be generally observed, but that it would be very unwise to have it definitely hardened into a constitutional prohibition. It is not desirable ordinarily that a man should stay in office twelve consecutive years as president, but most certainly the American people are fit to take care of themselves and stand in no need of an irrevocable self-denying ordinance. They should not bind themselves never to take action which under some quite conceivable circumstances it might be to their great interest to take. It is obviously of the last importance to the safety of a democracy that in time of real peril it should be able to command the service of every one among its citizens in the precise position where the service rendered will be most valuable. It would be a benighted policy in such event to disqualify absolutely from the highest office a man who, while holding it, had actually shown the highest capacity to exercise its powers with the utmost effect for the public defense. If, for instance, a tremendous crisis occurred at the end of the second term of a man like Lincoln, as such a crisis occurred at the end of his first term, it would be a veritable calamity if the American people were forbidden to continue to use the services of the one man whom they knew and did not merely guess could carry them through the crisis. The third term tradition has no value whatever except as it applies to a third consecutive term. While it is well to keep it as a custom, it would be a mark both of weakness and unwisdom for the American people to embody it into a constitutional provision which could not do them good and on some given occasion might work real harm there was one cartoon made while i was president in which i appeared incidentally that was always a great favorite of mine it pictured an old fellow with chin whiskers a farmer in his shirt sleeves with his boots off sitting before the fire reading the president's message on his feet were stockings of the kind i have seen hung up by the dozen in joe ferris's store at medora in the days when i used to come into town and sleep in one of the rooms over the store the title of the picture was his favorite author this was the old fellow whom i always used to keep in mind he had probably been in the civil war in his youth he had worked hard ever since he left the army he had been a good husband and father he had brought up his boys and girls to work he did not wish to do injustice to any one else but he wanted justice done to himself and to others like him and i was bound to secure that justice for him if it lay in my power to do so i believe i realized fairly well this ambition i shall turn to my enemies to attest the truth of this statement the new york sun shortly before the national convention of nineteen o four spoke of me as follows president roosevelt holds that his nomination by the national republican convention of nineteen o four is an assured thing he makes no concealment of his conviction and it is unreservedly shared by his friends we think president roosevelt is right there are strong and convincing reasons why the president should feel that success is within his grasp he has used the opportunities that he found or created and has used them with consummate skill and undeniable success the president has disarmed all his enemies every weapon they had new or old has been taken from them and added to the now unassailable roosevelt arsenal why should people wonder that mr bryan clings to silver has not Mr. Roosevelt absorbed and sequestered every vestige of the Kansas City platform that had a shred of practical value? Suppose that Mr. Bryan had been elected president. What could he have accomplished compared with what Mr. Roosevelt has accomplished? Will his passionate followers pretend for one moment that Mr. Bryan could have conceived, much less enforced, any such pursuit of the trust as that which Mr. Roosevelt has just brought to a triumphant issue? Will Mr. Bryan himself intimate that the federal courts would have turned to his projects the friendly countenance which they have lent to those of Mr. Roosevelt? Where is government by injunction gone to? The very emptiness of that once potent phrase is beyond description. A regiment of Bryans could not compete with Mr. Roosevelt in harrying the trusts, in bringing wealth to its knees, and in converting into the palpable actualities of action the wildest dreams of Bryan's campaign orators. He has outdone them all and how utterly the president has routed the pretensions of bryan and of the whole democratic horde in respect to organized labor 
how empty were all their professions their mouthings and their howlings in the face of the simple and unpretentious achievements of the president in his own straightforward fashion he inflicted upon capital in one short hour of the coal strike a greater humiliation than bryan could have visited upon it in a century he is the leader of the labor unions of the united states mr roosevelt has put them above the law and above the constitution because for him they are the american people this last i need hardly say is merely a rhetorical method of saying that i gave the labor union precisely the same treatment as the corporation senator la follet in the issue of his magazine immediately following my leaving the presidency in march nineteen o nine wrote as follows roosevelt steps from the stage gracefully he has ruled his party to a large extent against its will he has played a large part in the world's work for the past seven years the activities of his remarkably forcible personality have been so manifold that it will be long before his true rating will be fixed in the opinion of the race he is said to think that the three great things done by him are the undertaking of the construction of the panama canal and its rapid and successful carrying forward the making of peace between russia and japan and the seeing around the world of the fleet these are important things but many will be slow to think them his greatest services the panama canal will surely serve mankind when in operation and the manner of organizing this work seems to be fine but no one can say whether this project will be a gigantic success or a gigantic failure and the task is one which must in the nature of things have been undertaken and carried through some time soon as historic periods go anyhow the peace of portsmouth was a great thing to be responsible for and roosevelt's good offices undoubtedly saved a great and bloody battle in manchuria but the war was fought out and the parties ready to quit and there is reason to think that it was only when this situation was arrived at that the good offices of the president of the united states were more or less indirectly invited the fleet's cruise was a strong piece of diplomacy by which we informed japan that we will send our fleet wherever we please and whenever we please it worked out well but none of these things it will seem to many can compare with some of roosevelt's other achievements perhaps he is loath to take credit as a reformer for he is prone to spell the word with question marks and to speak despairingly of reform but for all that this contemner of reformers made reform respectable in the united states and this rebuker of muckrakers has been the chief agent in making the history of muckraking in the united states a national one conceded to be useful he has preached from the white house many doctrines but among them he has left impressed on the american mind the one great truth of economic justice couched in the pithy and stinging phrase the square deal the task of making reform respectable in a commercialized world and of giving the nation a slogan in a phrase is greater than the man who performed it is likely to think and then there is the great and statesmanlike movement for the conservation of our national resources into which roosevelt so energetically threw himself at a time when the nation as a whole knew not that we were ruining and bankrupting ourselves as fast as we can this is probably the greatest thing roosevelt did undoubtedly this globe is the capital stock of the race it is just so much coal and oil and gas this may be economized or wasted the same thing is true of phosphates and other mineral resources our water resources are immense and we are only just beginning to use them our forests have been destroyed they must be restored our soils are being depleted they must be built up and conserved these questions are not of this day only or of this generation they belong all to the future their consideration requires that high moral tone which regards the earth as the home of a posterity to whom we owe a sacred duty this immense idea roosevelt with high statesmanship dinned into the ears of the nation until the nation heeded he held it so high that it attracted the attention of the neighboring nations of the continent and will so spread and intensify that we will soon see the world's conferences devoted to it nothing can be greater or finer than this it is so great and so fine that when the historian of the future shall speak of theodore roosevelt he is likely to say that he did many notable things among them that of inaugurating the movement which finally resulted in the square deal but that his greatest work was inspiring and actually beginning a world movement for staying terrestrial waste and saving for the human race the things upon which and upon which alone a great and peaceful and progressive and happy race life can be founded what statesman in all history has done anything calling for so wide a view and for a purpose more lofty end of chapter ten recording by amanda hindman glenn mississippi